Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to our service of worship in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. It's lovely to have you with us today as we join to worship God, and a special word of welcome to all of Matthew's friends and family. Uh, thank you for coming along to support him in this special day when he comes to receive the sacrament of baptism. It's lovely to have you all with us, and we trust the Lord will bless us as we join together to praise and worship his wonderful name. Well, this morning, as we return to our summer playlist series in the Psalms, we come to Psalm 8. It's a wonderful psalm that proclaims the greatness and the wonder of our God. But it's also a psalm that reminds us as believers of our identity in Christ. Quite often in life, people will ask us that question, won't they? Who are you? And we come up with all kinds of things to determine who we are, who we're married to, what our job is, where we live, our name, all of those things. But as believers, our primary identity is that we are co-heirs with Christ, that he has saved us by his grace, that he has called us into relationship with his Father. That is who we are. That is who our image is. And in Psalm 8, King David points us beyond ourselves, to look to the one who has created us as his image bearers, God Almighty. Our call to worship declares, may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing so that by the power of the Holy Spirit you may abound in hope. That is the wonderful good news of the gospel, that in Jesus we have hope, in Jesus we have joy, all made possible by his indwelling Holy Spirit. We're going to join together to sing to his wonderful praise now as we join to sing a hymn that is based on various parts of Scripture, including Psalm 8. O Lord my God, when I in awesome wonder consider all thy works thy hands have made. Let us stand to sing how great thou art.
folks having sung to the Lord in praise, let's now come to him in prayer. Let us pray. O Lord, my God, when I in awesome wonder consider all the works thy hands have made. Father God, as we come to you, we do so with awesome wonder at your, that you are the creator, God. With the psalmist, we declare the heavens declare the glory of God. For there is not one molecule that you haven't made, not one star that you haven't created, not one grain of sand that you don't know about. For your power throughout the universe is displayed. For you spoke and the stars were hung in the sky. You planted the trees of various kinds. You chart the seas. You give the birds their sweet song. And yet not only are you our creator God, but you're our sustaining God. For in the palm of your powerful right hand, you hold all things together. You provide everything for your creation. The sun, the rain, the snow, the heat, the cold, the dew. You alone are the sovereign Lord and King of the universe. How holy and majestic is your name. And yet compared to your awesome greatness and holiness, we are confronted with the reality as the Apostle Paul declared, for all have sinned. And fallen short of the glory of God. Father we are not holy as you are. We are at times ungrateful. And impatient and unloving and unkind. We've marred the beauty of your creation. We run after selfish idols and thoughts. We don't worship you as we ought. Lord we are indeed sinners shaped in iniquity. And yet God of mercy. We pray that you would forgive us our many sins. Remove them from us. Hurl them into the depths of the sea, as your word says. And help us, Holy Spirit, to die to sin and to live for Christ, that our whole lives would sing, How great thou art. Father, we thank you for sending your Son, not sparing you. Send him to die, I scarce can take it in. We thank you, Lord Jesus, that on that cross you did indeed bear our burdens. You bled and died to take away our sin. You became sin for us, we who deserve to be separated from you for eternity in hell. And yet out of your great love, you died and shed your blood to save us when we repent from our sins and trust in Jesus Christ alone for salvation. How amazing that as believers... Our identity is in Christ. And we can indeed say, Then sings my soul, my Saviour God to thee. How great thou art. O Lord, we praise and adore you. We want to give you your place today as the King over all, the one who is worthy of all our worship and praise and adoration. And we do so all for the sake of Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. Amen. Boys and girls, do you want to come down to the front and I'll have a chat with you there? Well, you doing all right? Yeah, enjoying your summer holidays? Brilliant, great, great. Well, enjoy the last few weeks because what's coming up That bad word beginning with S. School. You enjoy every moment of it before you go back, will you? Yeah, absolutely brilliant. Now, I have a question for you. What town do we live near? Up here in Claggan, what town do we live near? What's down the road? Cookstown, there you go. There's the big sign and there's the main street. Brilliant. So we live near Cookstown. Right. My next question is this, okay. What island do we live on? Go ahead. Northern Ireland, absolutely right. There we go. Northern Ireland, and I have a big circle around the centre of Northern Ireland there, Kells and Connor, where I'm from. <laughs> Only joking. We're in Mid-Ulster, aren't we? Yeah, okay. Can anybody see where Cookstown is? On that map, can you see where Cookstown is? Over to the side of Loch Fay. There we go. If we click the next one. There we go. Cookstown, that side of Loch Fay. Right. Here's the next question. We live in a kingdom made up of four other countries, well, three other countries, including ourselves, four in total. Some kingdom, the something kingdom, 
Do you know what kingdom we live in? The United Kingdom? Yeah, we live in the United Kingdom. There we go, okay, with Scotland, Wales, and England. And it's really hard to see, but can you see Cookstown up there? It's just the other side of the A. There we go, all right, round about there, okay. So it's getting harder as you zoom out. It's getting harder to see Cookstown, isn't it? Right, here's the next question. What continent? That's a really hard one. Have you been doing geography? What continent are we in? There's seven of them. Yes. Great Britain. It's a very good guess, very good guess, but not quite, no. Great Britain is a part of it, okay. Well, we'll put it up on the screen. We're a part of Europe. Okay, this is Europe. Okay, that's the continent that we live on. And did anybody see Cookstown now? Well, we'll put this up. It's about there. Right, okay, so we're in Europe. Right, okay, now we live... What, what planet do we live on? That's an easier one. Yes. Earth. Yes, and the solar system. Can you see Earth? Can you see Cookstown from that? No, but we're on Earth, okay. So whenever you zoom out and you look at all those planets, it seems really small, doesn't it? But then here's the other thing. We are part of the universe called the Milky Way. So let's zoom out again. And we're about there somewhere. It's really hard to see Cookstown from there. Now, why am I talking about all of this and zooming out and zooming out and zooming out? Well, we're going to read a psalm from, from David, and he writes about Psalm 8. And he talks about the greatness of all that God has created. He looks out to the stars. He looks out all around him, the animals, the plants, everything that's around him. And he feels really small because of this great big universe and world that God has made. And do you know what he says? This is what he says. What is man that you are mindful of him and the son of man that you care for him. You know, there's lots of people today, boys and girls, who say that the world came about by chance. Big bang and everything came into existence. But is that true? It's absolutely false. Back in Genesis, we're told that God created everything. He created each and every one of us here today. And even whenever we feel really small, as we look out in the sky and we see all the stars in the universe, God still cares about you and me, and everyone here, so much so that he sent the Son of Man, Jesus, to die on a cross, so that when we come to him and trust in him with our lives, we can know him and be a part of his family forever. So even if you feel small, remember that God sees you, and he loves you, and he cares deeply about you, and he wants you to trust in him, so that you can know, as our memory verse says, The strength, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. You've listened so well. Can we say our memory verse together? After three. One, two, three. The Bible says in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Great. We're going to come to another special moment now, okay? And it's the baptism of of Matthew Clark. Okay, now you can sit here if you want, like you did last week. Do you want to sit here and see it? Yep, that's perfect. Okay. Now we're going to come to this special time, okay, and it's a special time in the life of Matthew and his family and us as a church family. Because we yes, we have infants baptized as Lucas was last week, but we also it's a joy to have an adult baptism as well. And I, as always, before I invite Matthew forward, I want to share something of what baptism, what we believe baptism is in the Presbyterian Church. You heard a bit of it from Richard last week, but it's never a bad thing to hear it again. But baptism is one of only two sacraments that the Lord Jesus Christ instituted for his church to follow. There are many interpretations and understandings regarding baptism, and therefore it's important for me to say that this is not a christening, it is not a naming ceremony. Baptism cannot save us, and it cannot Make us a Christian. Only the Lord Jesus Christ can. The Westminster Divines very helpfully in answering question 94 of the Shorter Catechism says, What is baptism? Baptism is a sacrament wherein the washing with water in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost doth signify and seal our engrafting into Christ and partaking of the benefits of the covenant of grace, our engagement to be the Lord's. The Lord Jesus, therefore, instituted the sacrament of baptism in the New Testament as a covenant sign and seal for his church. 
In Matthew 28, 19 to 20, we read that Jesus before ascending said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the end of the age. Jesus instituted baptism not only for the solemn admission of the person baptized into the visible church, which we see, but also to depict and confirm his engrafting of that person into himself, including them in the covenant of grace. The sacrament of baptism has its roots in the Old Testament. In Genesis 12, 1 to 2, God appeared to Abram and said, Go from your country, your people, and your father's household to the land I will show you, and I will make you into a great nation, and I will bless you, and I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing. To ratify God's covenant with Abraham, his descendants, God commands Abram to circumcise himself, his sons, and every male within his household as a sign and seal of their inclusion into God's family, a daily reminder of his promise. God declared in Genesis 17, 7, And I will establish my covenant as an everlasting covenant between me and you and your descendants after you for the generations to come to be your God and the God of your descendants after you. That is why within PCI, we baptize both true believers and only true believers in the Lord Jesus Christ and their children. Christ replaces circumcision, which was only for males with baptism, to include both males and females to receive this covenant sign. And the outward sign of baptism is the washing with water in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And it symbolizes how Christ's blood has cleansed us from our sins when we put our faith and trust in him. And the inward seal of baptism is when God in his grace and timing purifies our hearts and forgives us our sins in Jesus Christ, making us born again. Peter, on the day of Pentecost in Acts 2, 38 to 39, declared this. Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, the promises for you and your children and for all who are far off, for all whom the Lord our God will call. I hope you see that this is all about Christ and his work in our lives. Therefore, today, on profession of Matthew's faith in Jesus Christ as his personal Lord and Savior, we come to baptize him into this church fellowship. And so can I invite Matthew to step forward? All right. I don't kneel yet. We'll do yet. Sorry. We'll we'll get you kneeling yet. Don't worry. (laughs) Don't worry. Sorry. Sorry. Matthew, you have responded to the gospel call, and you've repented from your sin, and you're putting your trust in the Lord Jesus Christ and today you desire to be baptized. Be assured that as you truly profess your faith and are baptized into his name, that this sacrament shall be to you the sign and seal of the washing of your sins that Christ accomplished for you on the cross, the new birth by the Holy Spirit, and your response to God through Jesus Christ to walk in newness of life according to his holy word. Therefore, we give thanks for God's saving grace in your life, And we continue to commit to pray for you and your family that the Lord will continue to bless and use you for his kingdom purposes. I'm going to pray for you now and then I'll ask you to kneel. All right, let me pray. Let's pray. Gracious God, we come before you thanking you for the gift of salvation. We thank you for Jesus and his death and his resurrection that saves us from our sins. And Lord, we thank you for Matthew for how you've created him in your own image. You've known, you've loved him from before he was born for the encouragement that it has been to get to know him and his desire to know you better in his life. Father, we thank you for his Christian upbringing. We thank you for calling him to saving faith. We thank you for bringing him into fellowship with your people. Lord God, as Matthew and we as a congregation make vows before your holy God, give us the grace to fulfill these vows in Christ's strength and the Holy Spirit's power. For we ask it in his name and for his name's sake. Amen. Before you kneel, can I ask the congregation to please stand at this point? Matthew, you're about to make vows that declare that Jesus Christ is your creator and father, 
that Jesus, uh, uh, the God is your creator and father, that Jesus Christ is your Lord and Savior, and that the Holy Spirit is your sanctifier and guide. And we as a congregation are then going to vow to promise to support you as you live out these vows in your life. So your answer is I do, and we as a congregation is we do. Matthew, in presenting yourself for baptism, do you believe in one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit? Thank you. And do you trust in Jesus Christ alone as your Savior from sin and as Lord of your life? Thank you. Depending then on the grace of God, do you promise to live as a follower of Jesus Christ, led and empowered by the Holy Spirit? And do you commit as a soon-to-be-baptized member of the church, to worship, serve, give, and participate fully in its life and witness. Thank you. And the commitment by us as a congregation. As we receive Matthew into the fellowship of the church, do we promise to join with Matthew in the life of prayer, worship, and service that we together offer to God? We do. We do. Now, Matthew, if you can need, please. I'll get you this towel to put around you. I'd hate to ruin that good tie and shirt. All right. There you go. All right. Matthew Kyle Clark, I baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. And the blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be upon you now and forevermore. Amen. We join to sing the ironic blessing. According to Christ's command, Matthew is now received into the membership of the one holy universal apostolic church. And can I be the first to congratulate you? And I offer you the right hand of fellowship and you can stand up now and get your hair dry as well. Big believer in plenty of water, so there we go. Uh, we were joking earlier, I'll, I'll not try and carry you down the, uh, the aisles of the church, but um, we could do a piggy bag, but <laughs> maybe not. Congregation can please be seated, and Matthew, just before you go, um, I want to give you this Bible. I'm sure you have many Bibles, and a little certificate as a momentum of today, and also a book you'd asked in predestination as well, okay? So may the Lord bless you and keep you. I know that you're studying God's Word, and I do trust and pray that you will continue to grow as you study it and read it for yourself. Okay, God bless you. Thank you. If you want it, keep drying off. There we go, <laughs> just in case. <laughs> We're going to join together and uh, we're going to sing uh, another hymn now. The hymn that Matthew has picked for the baptismal hymn. Psalm 100, all people that on earth do dwell, sing to the Lord with cheerful voice. Let us stand and sing.
back to your seats, thank you. And as they're going back to your seats, if you want to turn with me in your Bibles to Psalm 8, you'll find our scripture reading there. So Psalm 8, beginning at verse 1. This is God's word to us. O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You have set your glory above the heavens. Out of the mouth of babes and infants you have established strength because of your foes to still the enemy and the avenger. When I look at your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have set in place, what is man that you are mindful of him? And the son of man that you care for him? Yet you have made him a little lower than the heavenly beings and crowned him with glory and honor. You have given him dominion over the works of your hands. You have put all things under his feet. All sheep and oxen and also the beasts of the field. The birds of the heavens and the fish of the sea. Whatever passes along the paths of the sea. O Lord, our Lord. How majestic is your name in all the earth. Amen. We thank God for his word and let's take a moment to pray that he will bless it to us as we come now to think about it. Father God, we do want to rejoice in what we have seen today. We want to thank you for the baptism of Matthew. We thank you for calling him to saving faith, for his desire to serve you and to live for you in all that he does. Lord, continue to undertake for him and bless him in his walk with you, to help him to grow deeper in his knowledge of you, and may he serve you with his whole heart, never looking back but always looking up and out for the sake of Jesus Christ. And Lord, now as we turn to your word, we pray that you would speak directly into each of our hearts and lives. That, Father, we would focus upon your word and your truth. That, Father, it would not be mere words from a man who is sinful. But, Father, that this would be the very word of God that speaks into each and every heart and soul gathered here today and who will listen online or through CD. Father, we pray it all for Jesus Christ's sake and glory. Amen. Well, Who Are You was a song by The Who, funny enough. And after they ask that question, who are you? They make this comment. How can I measure up to anyone now after such a love as this? For many of us, our identity is important to us. And everyone rightly wants to feel valued and loved and appreciated for who we are. But sometimes in life we aren't always happy with who we are, are we? We feel inferior to others. How could we measure up with them? They're better than me. They're better looking. They're smarter, taller, fitter, funnier, whatever it may be, than me. And sadly, when we start to think these things, well, we believe like the who that we are worthless with no value or no love. Self-image is a massive topic of concern in society today. I think you'll agree. And even, dare I say, within the church. However, we must all learn the lesson that David learned in Psalm 8. That what matters the most to God is who we are in Christ. If Jesus Christ, God's Son, is our Savior, well then that's what matters the most. Our identity in Jesus is key. And that is why we can find blessed happiness in our identity. Because notice that before King David even thinks about himself in this psalm, he turns to God. And he focuses upon him alone. He focuses on his love towards us in creating and sustaining us. Indeed, he bookends Psalm 8 with that wonderful phrase, O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name. In all the earth. You see we can only grasp who we are. By looking at who God is. And to help us understand who we are in Christ. Well let me highlight four points from Psalm 8. Firstly. We are of great value to God. As I said David opens by declaring the greatness. The majesty the power of God in his name. And his name by the way as God told Moses is I am who I am. And this should challenge us because when we think about who we are, well, we need to remember who God is first and who we are in him. 
For when we trust in Christ alone as our Savior, when we are his children and he is our Lord, as our new children's hymn, as we sung last year, said, the God of all creation is a friend to me. How amazing. That the God of all the universe, as we thought with the children, wants to be our Lord. Our Father. Because of Christ. And we can approach him like David in praise and prayer without hindrance. Now this privilege isn't for everyone or anyone. Rather it is destined for Christians. The name Christian means Christ's ones. God is the all-powerful one, yet the one who makes himself known to us. How valuable are we that God should condescend to our level to be with us. We who are filthy sinners, yet saved by his son's precious blood. It's mind-blowing, isn't it? But true. David continues to focus on God's glory in verses 1b. You have said your glory in the heavens. God not only created our known world for his glory, but he also made the heavens, the universe too. Verse 3, when I consider your heavens, the works of your fingers, the moon, the stars, which you have set in place. It all points us back to Genesis. When God created everything by the power of his word. He spoke and everything came into existence to display his majestic glory. Lennox observes with the naked eye one can see about 5,000 stars. With a four inch telescope one can see about 2 million. With a 200 inch observatory mirror one can see more than a billion. Considering the heavens makes us see the greatness of God. But despite the vastness of God's creation, notice we are of great value. Because God didn't stop after he made the world and the universe. No, he made you and he made me. Indeed, as David marvels at the creation, he asks in verse 4, What is man that you are mindful of him, the son of man that you care for? Such is our value to God that he created us to be a part of his great creation. David's bamboozled as to why God would be mindful of us to even care and and give us everything that we need, our very dignity, our value, our life. Indeed, that we could have a relationship with him as Father through the Son of Man's work upon the cross. I wonder today is your identity in Christ. If it is, then whatever you feel about yourself today, remember you have value in Jesus Christ. And that God the Creator, He is mindful of you. For secondly, we are image bearers, verse 5. You made Him a little lower than the heavenly beings and crowned Him with glory and honor. David reminds us that God made us higher than every living being and yet a little lower than the angels. He crowns us with glory and honor. How amazing again that God should be mindful of us sinners. But you see it goes back to Genesis again when God made man as the the pinnacle or the, the crown of creation as Spurgeon said. You see mankind isn't like any other animal. Well scientists suggest that we came from apes and all that jazz with evolution. David reminds us that that is false. We are God's image bearers. God said in Genesis 1.26, Let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness, so that they may rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky, over the livestock and all the wild animals and over all the creatures that move along the ground. God created us to be like God. But... Subordinate under him. John Stott says, God has invested human beings with royal sovereignty, crowning us with glory and honor and delegating to us the control of his works for his glory. We are valuable because we are made in God's image. We're different from the rest of the animal kingdom in that we can think and speak and act like God. As human beings, we know the difference between right and wrong, or at least we should Regardless of what some people may say out there. 
We are like God in his image, but subordinate to him. We are not God. And I think our day and age needs to remind themselves of this, don't they? Some think that they are as they kill children in the womb. As they kill off those who are elderly. As they go to war and wage it against those who are innocent. We are under God's authority, not man's. You see, as believers, we are to be like Jesus Christ. His son who was subordinate to his father. Jesus is the true archetype of what it means to be made in God's image. For he is God himself, very God and very man. He gives us the supreme example of what it means to live under God's rule uh, with glory and honor. And that's why we as believers, well, we stand up for justice, don't we? We support those in need. We show love to the homeless, the hopeless, the fatherless. We stand up against abortion and murder and euthanasia. We do so because we know that all life is sacred and important to God. Why? Well, if you haven't got it yet, it's because we're image bearers. From the unborn child to the elderly person and everyone in between, we are all God's children. Image bearers, but only those who have confessed Christ as Lord of their life can be known as Christ's ones. Only then can we know this blessed happiness despite what life may bring at us. Because thirdly, we're weak but strong. Go back to verse 2. From the lips of children and infants you have ordained praise because of your enemies to silence the foe and the avenger. Now this is a significant verse, indeed one that Christ quoted in Matthew 21, 13. Jesus having cleansed the temple and healed the blind and the lame, he he was challenged by the furious chief priests, particularly because children were out there standing and singing about Jesus, Hosanna to the son of David. Do you remember what Jesus said? Have you never read? From the lips of children and infants, Lord You, Lord, have called forth your praise. Jesus' point is this. God can use the weakest, the childlike, the vulnerable to display his power and strength and glory. Children and infants are precious to Jesus, but they're also the weakest in society. They need others to help them as they grow and feed and mature and develop. I know it all too well with Lucas. But we are all children before God our Father. Guzik writes, it is hard to think of anything more weak and helpless than a baby. Yet the same God who can ordain strength out of the mouth of babes and infants can give strength and support to me in the midst of my weakness. How often in scripture does God use the weak and the helpless to do mighty things? Think of Joshua and the mighty walls of Jericho. Gideon with only 300 men to defeat 10,000 Midianites. David himself, a mere boy, standing against Goliath, that mighty giant. When we're at our weakest, God is at his strongest. And no one wants to be weak. Today, people want to be bigger and greater and stronger and fitter and better looking than everyone else. But if our identity is in Christ, then we must embrace our weaknesses whilst we lean upon our Heavenly Father who promises to give us His strength. Paul wrote, For when I am weak, then I am strong. Not because of our strength, but because of that little babe who came into the world, into that manger, who grew up to be the greatest and strongest leader this world has ever known. Christ who submitted to the Father, who went to the cross, who died the weakest kind of death, So that we could be raised with him to everlasting life when we trust in him as Lord. Given strength to live for Christ in all we do. So dear friend, don't fret about your weaknesses. Rather turn them into strengths through Christ's empowering spirit. 
Allow God to use you for his glorious power and greatness as we praise the stronghold of our life with children and infants because God has silenced our foe and avenger Satan forever and even our worldly enemies he will silence. If our identity is in Christ then we can truly find blessed happiness in our weakness. For fourthly we're united to Christ. Verses 6 to 8. You made him ruler over the works of your hands. You put everything under his feet, all flocks and herds and the beasts of the field, the birds of the air and the fish in the sea, all that swim the paths of the seas. Now, as you read those verses, we all know that it doesn't always appear that we're rulers over the works of God's creation. Politicians have far too much power. Dictators like Putin and King Jong rule with an iron fist. There are wars and rumours of wars and natural disasters. Day and daily Christians are ostracised or ridiculed, criticised, even imprisoned because of their faith. In the animal kingdom, no one would dream of diving in with sharks or crocodiles, cattle and sheep to subdue them. But remember what God commanded Adam and Eve in Genesis 1.20. He says, be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth and subdue it. Rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky and over every living creature that moves on the ground. We are given the authority by God to rule his creation. However, as voice highlights, as part of this authority, mankind has the responsibility to wisely manage the creatures and resources of this earth in a way that gives God glory and is good for mankind. Sadly, mankind has failed. We do not use these things wisely or appropriately. God has given enough food and water and natural resources to supply his whole creation's needs. But because of greed, many today go hungry and thirsty and homeless because of careless rulers. Yet we praise God. That we do know him who is ruler over all. The king of kings and lord of lords. Who as the writer to the Hebrews. In speaking of Psalm 8 reminds us. But we see Jesus who was made a little lower than the angels. For the suffering of death crowned with glory and honor. That he by the grace of God might taste death for everyone. In bringing many sons to glory. You see when our identity is in Christ Jesus. We are united to him. He becomes our God and we his people. He rules in our hearts and lives by his spirit. And because of this we are sons of glory. Sons of God with all the power and rights of Christ. Destined to rule with him in glory one day. And this is all made possible. Through Christ's death and resurrection. Such was Christ's love for you and me that he died in order to bring us back to God, to unite us to him, to save us forever. And with Christ we will reign with him forever in glory. If you're a believer here today, Revelation 5.10 declares, you have made him to be the kingdom, our king and priest to serve our God and they will reign on the earth. It's mind-blowing, isn't it? This is our identity. If you're in Jesus Christ here today. As I close, I ask you, who are you? In 1991, the Queen was once refused entry to the Windsor Horse Show because she didn't dress Queen-like. She arrived at Windsor and a guard stopped her saying, Sorry, love, you can't come in without a sticker. And on face she said, I think if you check, I'll be allowed to enter. Apparently the guard thought that she was just some out there who was lost. Now we may not have the same mistake made against us. But it does matter who we are before God. To God, if we are in Christ, we are royalty. We are heirs, we are his children who are valued as image bearers. We are weak but strong because we are united to Jesus and nothing can change that. And how do I know? Well, because our King of Kings, the Lord Jesus Christ, went to the cross on our behalf to die in our place for our sins in order to save us and bring us into his family. As the who asked, how can I measure up to anyone now after such a love as this? 
The answer is by thanking Christ for his amazing love at Calvary and surrendering your whole life to him alone. As you sleep tonight, dear Christian, remember who you are in Jesus. Like David, may God's glory and splendor be lifted high in our lives. And if the Lord wills that we should wake up in the morning, we'll then again glorify God in prayer, remembering who you are in Jesus Christ. Can we truly conclude with David, O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. Amen. We join together to sing our third item of praise, the one that reminds us that God, as the uncreated one, has created everything and fashioned everything that we know in our world, and he is worthy to be crowned forevermore. We're going to join together and sing this item of praise, and as we do so, the offering will be received. Join once more for our prayer of thanks and intercession. Let us pray. <coughs> Almighty God, our Creator, we come before you in humble, 
humbleness and a desire to adore and I praise you. We thank you for creating and sustaining all things by your powerful right hand. For creating us in your image and indeed for saving us from our sins. Through the life, death, resurrection and ascension of your son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Oh, forgive us, Father, when we run after worldly things. When we seek after our own gain, help us to daily focus upon our identity in Jesus. Because that is the most important thing. That we would live lives that honor and glorify Jesus in every way. To crown you king forevermore. Eternal God, as we look out at our world, we realize that it is far from perfect. Many today are image driven to look, act and speak a certain way where leaders are seeking out to do, their own, to do one another. Politicians are seeking out after the popularity vote. CEOs of businesses are seeking to outbid and outperform others. Young people are seeking to be more popular, smarter than others. And yet dare I even say church members and leaders are seeking to build their own kingdoms rather than yours. Father, we realize image is a massive issue across our world and society. And we've only scratched the surface. But we do pray into each of these situations that people would be wise and not easily led astray. That they would keep the main things, the main things. That we especially would focus upon the word of God because that is the guide for life and life eternal. <coughs> We do want to think of our young people at this time, those who received A-level results this past week and for those who received GCSEs next week. Oh Lord God, would you surround and help our young people to remember that their worth in your eyes is worth far more than a grade on a piece of paper. Help them, whatever their results, to be able to be wisely directed into the right direction moving forward whether that's to go to tech or college or university, to take up an apprenticeship, to even just go into employment. Would you guide and direct them, we ask. Every single one of us is gifted differently and every single one of us has a role to play in our society for the glory and the honour of Jesus Christ. And for those of our young people who profess you as Lord, we pray that you would help them to remain strong. That they would remain true to you. That they would shine their light before others as your word says. That they may see their good works and glorify our heavenly father. Undertake for them we pray. God of grace we pray into these, these days of unrest and racial attacks across our country and even in the mainland. Pains us to see violence once again in our streets especially to those who are legitimately seeking asylum. We realize, Lord Jesus, that the Lord Jesus himself was, a, was an asylum seeker at the start of his life. As he fled with his parents to Egypt from that evil dictator, King Herod. And we also know that you're, that you're a God who has told us to love the foreigner residing within our gate. To support them with the love of Christ. We pray for those who have been affected by these hate crimes, asking that you would help them not to live in fear. But to know that your people in this land have a desire to reach out and to help them and to point them to the Lord Jesus Christ. We think of charities and churches who are seeking to support and comfort those affected. We think of PCI's International Meeting Point and Friendship House. We pray, Lord God, that you would support them as they seek to bring aid to those affected. We also want to remember those seeking to prevent violence and to keep us safe. We think of the PSNI in particular asking you to protect them from those who would cause harm, whatever the violence may be. We pray that you would watch over and guide them. We pray for our emergency and armed forces. We pray for the fire service, the search and rescue, Coast Guard, RNLI, especially during this summer season. Would you keep people safe? We pray for our health service and ambulance service too that are under extreme strains and pressures. Oh Lord God, would you provide for their needs? Would you enable them to have the resources they need? Would our politicians do everything in their power to support them? Because we are so grateful for all their work. May we as your people keep them in prayer daily. And finally, gracious God, we pray for all in our congregation 
who need your, your comfort and support in these days, especially those who mourn the loss of loved ones recently. For those who are receiving treatments and tests and results, those who are mentally, emotionally or spiritually drained, we uphold them to you and we confess them in our hearts now, their names to you. Give them your peace and grace, we ask, Lord. Watch over their families and carers. Give them the strength that they need and help us as a congregation to be known for our love with one another, to be united by the Spirit. And may our identity as a church and individuals be one that honors Jesus Christ because it's in his name that we pray. Amen. We conclude by singing our final item of praise. You're the word of God the Father. may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit rest, remain, and abide with you and your loved ones until Christ calls or comes, and then forevermore. Amen.